We are going into the text. So this morning, um, we have another really an iconic passage uh, that we're looking at. And if you're familiar with church, you've heard this passage, I'm sure. Many of you perhaps have memorized this passage, and this is one of the two passages that are painted on our walls uh, in our prayer, um, prayer room. And so in this section of Philippians chapter 4, we'll see some incredible, we'll see an incredible promise at the end that is this like breathtaking about the peace of God. We'll be charged or commanded to do a number of things, including rejoicing in the Lord always, uh, including being gentle, including uh, not being anxious, and praying, which are tall commands. And in the very center of our passage for this morning is a a very short sentence that is theologically packed, that is super important for us to anchor this whole passage in, and it says, the Lord is near. So, if you have your Bible, go ahead, open it up to Philippians chapter 4, and if you're here, you don't have a Bible, not familiar with the Bible, right in front of you, we have a Bible. It's right there in the back of the pew. Turn to page 1013. That's on page 1013, Philippians chapter 4. And by the way, if you're like me, um, this passage is um, a struggle, right? <laughs> because at times... I struggle with rejoicing. At times, I struggle with being gentle. At times, I struggle with being anxious. At times, I struggle with praying with thanksgiving. You may be the same way. This passage stands and the goal is that in our short time left in this, ser- in this uh, ser- uh, service, that you will get some help as to what this means and then how we can live it out in our reality. Okay, so here we are, Philippians chapter 4. We're just going to look at verses 4 through 7. I'm going to read it for us. It starts this way. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay. That's where we're stopping. Like I said, this is an incredible passage. And in this section of the book of the letter of Philippians, and you'll see this in Paul's letters in particular, the very um, second half of the book or the end of the book has to do with application. So if you look at this, understand it's in a greater context what Paul has been telling us all along. And I would urge you to read it in its context so that we can best understand it. So we're going to look at the various elements of this passage. First is this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, so far in chapter 4, we have seen the phrase, in the Lord, okay, three times. Verse 1, we've been told in chapter 4, stand firm in the Lord. Verse 3 of this chapter says, be of the same mind in the Lord, And now we read, rejoice in the Lord. Now, we do have to remember that Paul is writing this book from prison, okay? And it wasn't nearly as nice as our prisons. Not that our prisons are like places you want to like five-star hotels, okay? Our prisons, they feed you. There's running water, there's electricity, the roof doesn't leak. I, I've never been in personally in a cell for a long period of time, but they're pretty nice, relatively speaking, to what was going on there. 
the prison, you don't get fed by them. You have to get fed by friends. You have to pay for all your expenses. They don't care about bugs and rats and all of these things, and they're not nice to you at all. So picture yourself. Here's Paul in a prison uh, situation, whatever that is, writing, rejoice in the Lord always. And if you remember, not only is he experiencing personal issues of pain and discomfort and loneliness and all the rest, challenges, he also wrote about struggles, opposition from people outside of the church. He also wrote about uh, a conflict of various members inside of the church. He already wrote about a man named Epaphroditus who almost died and he's been nursing back to health. So Paul is not writing these words because everything is great in his life. Quite the opposite. Things were not going well in his circumstances. And yet he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Continue to rejoice. I will say it again. That, that phrase means, I will repeat it over and over again. That we need to continue to rejoice in the Lord. Now, I want to let you off the hook in this regard. He's not saying rejoice in your circumstances. Okay, you, you notice that, right? I've sat across people in um, horrific situations. Right? Facing untimely death, facing tragedies, facing divorce, okay, facing abuses, facing... Um, rapes facing all of these things and I would not sit down with them and say well rejoice in the Lord rejoice in this circumstance Paul is saying to us that circumstances at times are horrific right? horrific and I'm not going to downplay those and say well you know it's okay um, things are really really hard sometimes Sometimes they're really good, but sometimes they're horrible. So Paul is not telling us to rejoice in your circumstance. But he says, I want you to rejoice in something that is beyond and above and below your circumstance. Rejoice in the Lord. Okay. Now what does this mean, right? Now we know have the mind in the Lord. It has Christ's mindset. This is Philippians chapter 2 about becoming a servant, becoming obedient, following God. Rejoice in the Lord is something that we have to, in the midst of difficulties, focus our mind to do. Okay. What do we have in the Lord that we can rejoice about that is above and beyond our circumstances? This is what he's talking about. Even in the midst of darkness, we can remind ourselves that number one, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That does not change, nor is it dependent upon your circumstances. We have forgiveness. Right? If you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Right? That's beyond our circumstance. Jesus says, behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with and I've gone to prepare a place for you. There are promises in Christ that we have that Paul is telling us. No circumstance can take these away from you. Right now you are facing perhaps trials, hardships of many kinds. And this is all over scripture. In the midst of those things. We also have much to rejoice in. This is what Paul's talking about. This could be the underlying, underlying soundtrack of our life, right? The music of heaven knowing that this is just temporary. And eternity is assured, not based upon your circumstances, but based upon the character of Christ, right? His promise and His goodness. So again, I don't know what you're facing today. 
I know some of the stories. I know some of the issues. But I know that in our lives, we don't have a time in which everything is perfect. It doesn't happen. Right? Not on this side of eternity. I want you to remember this. And please, if you're going to memorize a passage, this is a great one. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Rehearse what He has done. Rehearse what He says to you. Rehearse the promises. You're going to need to continue to do this, and this will sustain you in times when it's dark. The light of Christ will always be shining. He continues giving us another command, and there come fast and furious. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then he connects it to this. Let your gentleness be evident to all. So this is another thing for us to put in to practice. Now, in our society, gentleness is not a highly regarded virtue, okay? I grew up uh, with two younger brothers, and then I had three stepbrothers. So there were six boys living together uh, under 18 at the same time, okay? Gentleness was not on the menu, right? I don't hear anyone saying, when I grew up, I want to be gentle, right? Um, that would be actually a good thing, right? So we don't necessarily value this trait and surely we do not value it as we should. We value, what, strength and courage? We value the person who lands their punches, right? But we are called as Christians, here it is, to gentleness, right? Now, in defining gentleness scripturally, this is what it means. This is not being a quarrelsome, argumentative easily angered or violent person, right? Are you quarrelsome? You're just looking to pick a fight, right? You can't wait till Thanksgiving comes when you can sit down next to your relatives and talk politics. <laughs> this divides families, by the way. This divides churches, by the way. Do you have a mindset that you're ready to go, right? You're ready to argue. You're ready to, you know, you have a um, very sensitive trigger that if something, somebody says something to you, you're ready to fight right now. Why is it that we become this way? What's wrong with being civil, right? What's wrong with just listening? What's wrong with you can stand your ground, but you can do it in a way that's gentle, right? I like the points of some of the people who talk on YouTube about various things, but I often don't like how they make their points. Smash them in the face, right? Sometimes we salivate to watch the uh, presidential debates. <laughs> you guys are like, really? <laughs> some people do. Because they can't wait until their candidate rips the other one a new one. Right? You understand what I'm talking about. How are we helped by being argumentative and quarrelsome and easily angered? We're called as Christians to be gentle. Gentleness is not weakness. You can win by your actions and your inner actions. We're called to love our enemies. You know how radical that is? Right? Well, you've never met my Uncle John <laughs> or my grandfather or your neighbor or your co worker. Jesus' call to love our enemies is radical and unlike other religions okay, in so many ways. Gentleness, 
What if we respected and loved each other enough to listen to each other? What if we decided that instead of being argumentative or easily angered, we just ratchet it down? Paul connects, rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be known to all, and perhaps you need to work on this. And then he connects it to this foundational phrase. I'm going to tell you how this connects to the both of the commands we had previously and how it connects to not being anxious, right? Now, if you look at this passage, when you see this little phrase, the Lord is near, it seems to me out of place, right? Command, rejoice, right? Command, be gentle. Command, don't be anxious. Command, pray, promise, and this phrase, the Lord is near. Now, if you're not paying attention, you'll probably skip, all, you'll skip over it, right? You'll say, oh, yep, 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 I need not to be anxious, I need to pray. Or, yep, 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 God, help me to rejoice. But we just skip this super important phrase. This helps us. Remember, if you're going to do this stuff, receive the promise, remember the Lord is near. Okay, so what does that mean? Right? Well, there's two primary, primary applications of that. One is what we sang about today, that God is with us. Okay? The Lord is near. Scripture says the Lord is not far away from anybody we just call out to him. So the Lord's not on a mission trip somewhere else and can't be concerned about you and your issues and what's going on. The Lord is attentive to his children when we call to him. Remember that. He's just a quote-unquote phone call away. We pray his spirit is here. The Lord is with you. You are never alone. So it's okay then to be gentle. It's okay then to rejoice in him. It's okay to him to not be anxious because he is with you. The Lord is your shepherd. Thank you, Ashley, for telling us this, reminding of this. Now the second um, meaning of this phrase, the Lord is near, is that the Lord is near to his coming, near to his return. If you look at this phase and you, phrase and you look at it in Scripture, there's plenty of places that says, like 1 Peter chapter 4, the end of all things is near. And James chapter 5, the coming of the Lord is at hand. In Revelation, he talks about, I am coming soon. Okay. Now, when these things were written, it was 2,000 years ago. And you're like, well, dude, it's been 2,000 years. That doesn't seem soon to me. But in the totality, in the, the, the totality, in the perspective of eternity, 2,000 years is like a mm, day. Scripture says that, right? So how does knowing that the Lord is with us, and how does knowing that the Lord's second coming, His return, is near, how does this help us not to be anxious? How does this help us to be gentle? Well, it helps us in knowing that when the Lord who sees all and knows all, when he returns, he will give to men and women what they're due, what they've done in the body, both in repayment to the righteous and, um, what's the word? Dealing with those who do wrong. Okay. So if you know that the one who knows all things, who keeps tabs of all things, will return to reveal all things and reward all things, you don't have to prove your point to everyone all the time to get your way across. Right? You don't have to be anxious, fearfully anxious, because his promises are going to be true. You don't have to settle the score with everyone, but you can return good for evil. This is how you overcome evil, by the way. Right? Knowing 
that the Lord is near helps us. Helps us to rejoice in Him. Helps us to be gentle. Helps us not to be anxious. And to pray to Him. My hope is that as you look to apply one of these things, and I'm asking you to apply one, if you get that one down, go to the next one, go to the next one. Take one thing today. But you have to connect it that the Lord is near. It's why you can be gentle. This is why we don't be anxious. This is why we can rejoice. The Lord is near. It'll help you. So Paul takes this phrase, the Lord is near, be gentle, rejoice. And then he says this in verse 6, the first part, do not be anxious about anything. This is hard. Right? Now, I'm going to define anxiousness for you. There's two different types of anxiousness. Even in, in this book of Philippians, talked about uh, Epaphroditus being anxious, right? And Timothy being anxious so people would know about him, okay? There is a type of anxious that this is not addressing, right? You might be anxious that your team is going to score the goal, okay? There's an anxiousness. You might be anxious to receive your paycheck that was promised to come to you, and you're kind of anxious about that, right? You might be anxious if your kids are driving through a massive thunderstorm with tornadoes that they're going to make it, right? There's an anxiousness that is based in love, and then there's an anxiousness that is based in fear, We're talking about the fear anxiousness, the one that robs peace from us. And so in this command, it's a it's a twofer. Don't do this, but do this. Okay? It's connected. So when you recognize that you are fearfully anxious. And you probably, some of you feel this all the time. Some of you occasionally, some of you rarely, but it comes up. I know the scripture says don't be anxious. And I want to be a person who is mature in their faith and like Christ. You can look to Christ. Was Christ ever anxious in this way? The answer would be no. Let me addend that. Right? Anxious about going to the cross, but in his anxiety, so to speak, at Gethsemane, what did he do? Prayed. So, when you feel anxiously fearful, we're told not to do this. Well, how can we not do that? Rest of the ver- excuse me, rest of the verse of verse six, but in every situation, right? So we have this, okay? Don't be anxious about anything, and this repeated, and then in every situation, right? Okay? By prayer. Petition. Okay, that's taking the low point, petitioning the Lord. Coupling that prayer with thanksgiving. Then present your requests to God. This is prayer that is like someone on their knees, right? Just down here praying. Being on your knees, the scripture doesn't tell us, you know, you have to pray on your knees for God to hear you. It doesn't even tell us you have to close your eyes for God to hear you or fold your hands, right? Now, these things can help us because it's a posture of your heart, it's an expression, right? Closing our eyes helps us to recognize we're not talking to those who are in the room. If there are people in the room, we are talking to God. It helps. This helps because it puts us in a posture of lowering ourselves in petition. And so when we ask God about our anxious, fearful thoughts, in which you and I have at times, we're asking Him not as someone who is demanding 
him, you've got to fix this, God, and if you don't, then I'm leaving. Right? Perhaps you've prayed that way at times. Right? It's praying in a way that acknowledges God's sovereignty and acknowledges God's goodness because you pray with, what's the word? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Now, in the midst of anxiety that can be crippling or fearful, being thankful for something helps you. When you are fixated on what that issue is, right? all you see is that issue and you see nothing else, right? It's just like, you know, I know my fist is bigger than Armando, right? It's bigger than him. Like, if you measure this, this is like, I don't know, two inches. He's like 70 inches. But if I'm fix- fixating on my fist and all I can see is my fist, I can't see Armando. I can't see any of you. Why? Because I brought my problem so close that it blinds me from the reality of the room. Same is true, perhaps, in your life in which you are thinking about some issue, some problem, some person, and all we can do is see it. And so, instead of bringing God near, we bring our problem near. And if all we can see is our problem, we can't see anything else. It is dark, and we become afraid. And this is what I'm asking you to do. Look beyond the issue, the anxiety, the problem, look to the promise giver, right? Look to the presence of God, right? God, I give you this circumstance. It's beyond my control. God, I'm nervous and afraid. I'm worried. I'm scared. Just be honest, right? You're not going to impress God by trying to convince him you're something other than you actually are, okay? You hear this, that'll just free you in prayer, right? Let's be, like, real. Right? This is like your dad who loves you, okay? Friend who loves you, right? Let's be real. Hey, I pray this way a lot. It's so helpful. God, I'm frustrated this morning. God, I, I, I'm concerned about this conversation that's going to happen today that I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pay my bills or find a place to live, or whatever that thing is. When I and when you talk to God, say, God, I'm going to focus in on you. That's why the Lord's Prayer starts with, Our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right? Starts there. Because if we fix our minds on who he is, everything else fades and he comes into focus. Do you hear me? Right? He comes here. Please do this. It will help you. Especially in anxiety, that's fear. God, I, I, I want to see you and you talk about thanksgiving. God, I thank you that you are a sovereign and you're in control. God, I thank you that you are my strength. God, I know that there's promises ahead. And God, I thank you that I can pray to you and you can go on and on and on. And once you get on the thankful train, it'll take you a long way. Instead of just seeing the obstacles. And I, I want you to be helped this morning. This is not a message of, oh, you better do this and you better not, you know, better be gentle. These are better ways for us to live that God gives us. And then there's a promise. This is the promise. Okay. And we love this part, right? So it's a don't do this, but do this. And if you say, like, don't be anxious. But pray, and if you pray, then, or and, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, beyond your capacity to figure it out, that peace will stand guard. What is it guarding? Our hearts and our minds. Oh, here's the phrase again. In Christ Jesus. 
will place herself on the rock, will place herself back in him. We recognize that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, that we're in him. So regardless of what happens, this isn't a formula that everything will turn out perfectly if you pray this. Sometimes you get in a motorcycle accident but you can survive. Sometimes it doesn't turn out exactly as you want, but you can have peace. And this is the phrase, right? Sometimes Christ calms the storm, and then some other times He calms you. And it's a peace that is beyond you because you can't control it, nor do you make it, nor is it dependent upon you. Our responsibility is to pray. And then God guards us. Right? Well, what is He guarding us from? Anxiety in this passage. Right? And it's going to come in again, believe me. Right? We fixate on worrying. <laughs> I'm asking us to fixate on Christ and to pray. And you're going to have to train yourself to do this, right? If you do it again, it comes in again, you pray again. Comes in again, you pray again. You come in again, you pray again. Comes in one more time, you pray again. And if you train yourself in doing this, you'll learn, you'll become to a point where when you hear something or you feel something, your automatic response is to turn to God in prayer. And if that's not your typical response, and perhaps it's not, right? Train yourself to do this. I feel something, I think something, I'm going to pray. Oh yeah, instead of talking to this person, that person, this person, that person, this person, going to bed worrying, talk to the person who matters most and can do the most about it. First, right? Okay? This is a remarkable passage. So I'm going to end there. Can we do a song in three or four minutes? Where's Justin? He's probably in the back. Oh, here you are. Right here, looking at me the whole time. Come on up. Thank you for leading us today. Yeah, I appreciate it. My hands are freezing, sorry. So, you know, I probably won't preach on this passage, I don't know if I'll preach on it ever again here, okay? Just kind of crazy to think. Maybe I will. I'll bring it up in conversation. But don't let it go. <laughs> Read it. Memorize it. And I'm asking you to do just, just one thing. And I don't know what that thing is for you. Right? You know. You say, oh man, I am not gentle. Okay, that's your area. If you say, man, I am a sourpuss all the time, okay? Work on rejoicing in the Lord. Could be that you're anxious or what have you. I don't know. Please work on it. There's questions at the end. If you're in a part of a growth group, you'll talk about it. You can talk about it on the ride home if you rode with anybody or in the bus. You can talk about it. So I'm going to do a short prayer. We're going to sing just um, a quick song. And we'll leave with a blessing. So God, thanks for my friends who are here. I'm grateful for them. God. God, thank you for our brothers and sisters who are in the room. Lord, that you've united us. Because you are our Father that makes us each brothers and sisters. God. And God, we heard a lot of stuff today. And I know because we prayed that you're working in this room. And God, I don't know all the stuff you're doing, but I know you're doing it. God, will you help us to continue to grow into the image of your Son? Lord. God, may this passage mark us. Help us to be people who rejoice in the Lord. Help us to be really loving and gentle with each other because you're near. 
God, I ask that you would help our individual anxiety and our collective anxiety about the nature of our world and the nature of the world. God, I ask that we would be people of prayer, that we would be people that has their prayers laced with thanksgiving, that we would fix our eyes on you. And God, I ask that you would, well, I know you're going to do it because you promised it, that you would give us your peace that's in Christ Jesus. So God, may we have that peace in our life. We thank you for your word that is eternal, God. We thank you for your spirit, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints, God. We thank you that you are near us and you hear us. In Jesus' name, amen.